Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. There's a lot of talk about the direction the market's going to take, what product type is going to be the best, how the world has changed so much in the last few months. Well, today, we're going to share what we believe to be the single best opportunity in real estate right now. And we've got an amazing guest on the Real Estate Guys radio program. When the world changes, investing strategy changes too. The coronavirus is disrupting economies, financial systems, and daily life like nothing in modern history. Sheltering in place might protect you from the virus, but a wait-and-see approach to investing now is like pulling the sheets over your head while the house burns down. It's not the time to be complacent. So we're calling our huge network of thought leaders, seasoned investors, and technical experts to find out what they're seeing, thinking, and doing to mitigate risk and capture opportunity, and we're recording all of it. We're calling it our Coronavirus Crisis Investing Webinar, and it's totally totally free. All you need to do is register. Remember, mainstream media doesn't talk to real estate investors. They don't understand you because Wall Street pays them not to. That's why the real estate guys are here. To register for the Crisis Investing Webinar, simply send an email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com. That's crisis at realestateguysradio.com. Real world wisdom is the best vaccine for a healthy financial future. Send your email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms, and with me as usual, it's our co-host and financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. Today, we are making a big, bold claim, and that is of all the things you could do in real estate, and we talk about a lot of them, we're going to talk about the single best opportunity in real estate right now, and whether or not you agree, I want you to stay with us for the premise, and we've got a great guest who's going to help solidify some of that, but there's a ton of things you could be doing right now. With COVID-19 hitting the world in the way that it has, we're seeing both current opportunity because there are owners with stressful situations and don't wanters and uh, tenants with uncertainty. And then I think all of us see there will be another, if not a completely new opportunity when the dust settles, however long that may take. And so it's uprooted a lot of real estate. Resort real estate is reeling. Airbnb is having a tough time. A lot of uh, retail and, and office space is floundering. Meanwhile, there are some bright spots in real estate, but even the, the bread and butter real estate of single family homes and multifamily have been hit hard by so many people out of work and whether or not they're getting the kind of help from the government they could or should or would. So there's a lot up in the air. And yet with all that going on, we think it's pretty clear where the opportunity is. Yeah. I mean, I think that the COVID-19 crisis has set off a tsunami of events. There's a whole cascading thing that's happening at a macro level and obviously in people's personal lives all over the place. And of course, as we say all the time, when there's chaos, there's opportunity and there's going to be a lot of opportunity. But big picture, you have distressed assets uh, coming online. Companies are going bankrupt. People can't make loans, foreclosures, all the things that happened in 2008, but bigger. Now, nobody celebrates those bad things happening, but the fact is they are happening and they're probably Probably going to have more of them happening. And it's going to require a bunch of money and a bunch of people to go in and kind of clean up the mess after the fact. That's the way it works. To provide the economy with the money it needs to go through all of this, the Fed is printing unprecedented trillions of dollars. And so, you know, if you're sitting out there as an entrepreneur, as an investor, you're just like, okay, how can world can I put myself in the flow of money? How can I be in a position where all those trillions of dollars come by me? Well, you can jump into the Wall Street casinos and compete with the sharks. You can try to do some of those types of things. You can maybe apply for some loans if you've got some good outlets. But right now, I mean, the opportunity to actually aggregate capital because there's going to be so much of it. Take advantage of some of these assets that they've been inflating that I think most people who are in are riding, but realize they're not long-term solutions. And ultimately, I believe the marketplace is going to wake up, smell the reality, and they're going to want to move towards real assets. We're already seeing some of that. And so if you're out there in the real estate space and you have the opportunity to bring deals to money, you can be in the flow of funds and get some content sensation on the pipe. And that's where the big opportunity is right now. Yeah. So big picture on this is the winners are going to be few and far between. That's all there is to it. If you're out competing with all the big boys and girls, that is challenging as a single investor. You might be able to find a particular opportunity and exploit it. You might find a don't want her in your own database and be able to put together a deal. But the safest thing to do 
is to invest together. Whether you're a passive investor and you don't know where to turn, you find a seasoned, sophisticated, storied investor that does participation this way, real estate syndication, we call it, where lots of people come together and invest in something. Or if you're that person, you've got all the inroads into real estate. You've got the right contacts, the right experience, and you could put together some money, which you have to do legally, which our guest will certainly talk about today, and create a much better outcome for everybody. It diversifies the risk. It increases the likelihood of success. It does all kinds of things. And of course, we've been singing out of this songbook for a long time. We started doing a, an event, a seminar on educating people about syndication back in 2011. And we said then it was the single best opportunity in real estate. And I don't think anything's changed except for the better in that regard. There's going to be more opportunity and it's a situation where the Pareto principle is going to apply, the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the money to be made in the next few years is going to 20% of the people. And that's no diss on the people that you know aren't gonna be able to make that part of it. They're gonna be in the also ran category because they just don't have the breadth and depth of relationships and market knowledge and experience and team that sophisticated sophisticated professional syndicators do. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you, to your point, Robert, you create diversification by doing this. You have the opportunity to go bigger so you can create market diversification, scale, uh, asset type diversification. But I think probably the biggest thing is the ability to be big enough to bring on team. And right now the marketplace is full of talent. People have been laid off, quality people left and right. So you can get tech people, you can get uh, financial people, you can get people who are uh, able to, to do investor relations, salespeople, project managers. And you say, well, how can I afford all those people? You raise the money and it's in the model. You do a big project. And so the mission is to be an aggregator of not just capital, but people and talent. And the thing is, we got excited about this in 2011 because we were coming out of the 2008 financial crisis and we saw the very same circumstances that we see today. The difference is it was a lot smaller. So if the opportunity was great after the 2008 financial crisis, which was smaller than what this is ultimately going to be, then the argument, I think, is safe to say the opportunity is going to be a lot bigger here today than it was even back in 2011. The, the law has opened up to make it easier. There's a lot more structure. Obviously, you know, we're nine years into developing training programs. We've dealt with lots of syndicators. Our network in regard to people who know how to syndicate has grown. We've learned a ton and we're not the only ones. I mean, there's other people out there doing it. The big concern is this. People who are out there who are maybe already know how to make money in real estate and are structured properly, their friends and family are going to look at them and go, wow, you're doing okay. And I'm, I'm not doing so good. I got my 401k. I got my little bit of equity in my house. I maybe got my life savings. I got to figure out what to do. Can you help me? And you're going to say, yeah, sure, I can help you. And you suddenly you say, wow, I could maybe get four or five people together like that. The next thing you know, you're putting together a syndication, except you don't know what you're doing. And especially you don't know what you're doing from a legal compliance point of view. You may not even know that there are laws that you need to be aware of and follow. So this is a message we felt was very important to get out right now because there are going to be people who listen to a show like this that are active real estate investors that are going to see the opportunity and begin to act on it without really making sure they understand. So we're going to share with you today where maybe some of the bodies are buried and where some of the landmines are buried, I should say, uh, and things that you should be careful of if you decide to go down this path. We encourage you to do it because we think it's a great opportunity, but you got to do it right. We talk about this line that you cross over when you raise money from other people. Up until then, you're your own person. You're funding your own deals. You're qualifying for your loans. You're finding markets. You're building teams. And that's all great. If there's a problem, it lands on you and you're responsible. The minute you take in somebody else's money, the whole world changes and in a good way, but also in a way you need to be careful and respectful of. And so real estate syndication isn't, hey, me and my buddies each going to throw a hundred grand in the hat and go buy something. It's bigger than that. And the opportunity is bigger than that. And if you're a passive investor, I think you're going to learn some things today for sure. But really the show, this show is tailored towards the person who thinks I see potential opportunity in being the person raising the money. If you've got 
gotten to that point where you're Fanny and Freddied out, or your eyes are bigger than your checkbook, you're already fully deployed, but you still have desire and passion and teams and capacity to go do deals, then perhaps real estate syndication is for you. When we come back, you're going to meet our syndication attorney and great friend, Mauricio Raul, today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. Hear ye, hear ye. Registration is now open for The Real Estate Guys' 19th Annual Investor Summit. Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Returning this year, our sales legend Tom Hopkins, the editor of the Gold Newsletter Brian London, international real estate developer Beth Clifford, and Jim Rohn's 18-year business partner Kyle Wilson. And joining us live and in person for his ninth Investor Summit, Peter Schiff. Plus, returning for his ninth Investor Summit, best-selling author and the Rich Dad Advisor for Real Estate, Ken McElroy. Plus, lots more to be announced. It all begins June 11th in beautiful Belize. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click the tab that says Summit to reserve your spot. This transformational week is like no conference you've ever attended. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Peter Schiff, Ken McElroy, and an all-star faculty on the 19th Annual Investor Summit. Don't be like Charlie, who scans the internet for IRA information, often getting bad information from copycats who have no idea what they're doing. You deserve to work with a reputable firm that specializes in one thing, the EQRP. Lucky for you, Congress just made it possible for you to get up to $200,000 out of your current 401k or TSP so you can invest that money in real estate or even your own business. Even if you're still working, it's possible to get access to all this money tax-free. Whether you're a full-time investor, a doctor, or a government employee, even if you have employees, the EQRP is your secret weapon. You'll never see the strategy in Money Magazine, only here with the Real Estate Guys. Every major accounting firm in America is quietly sharing this strategy with their wealthy clients, helping them get their funds freed from 401k jail. Hi, I'm Damian Lupo, and we have your solution. With the CARES Act expiring soon, the strategy will be gone forever. The EQRP company is ready to help you unleash your retirement funds now. Want to learn more about this strategy? Send an email to eqrp at realestateguysradio.com for my special EQRP report today. Hey, it's Ken McElroy. I listen to The Real Estate Guys, and so should you. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys, radio program heard every weekend on this great radio station and all the time at realestateguysradio.com and your favorite podcast outlets. We're talking today about what we think is the single best opportunity in real estate this minute, and that is aggregating capital, putting together bigger deals, doing real estate syndications. To help us talk about that from the legal perspective, let's welcome attorney Mauricio Raul. How are you? Good, Robert. Uh, always great to be on. Well, it's always great to have you. We actually call you the anti-lawyer because you don't behave like most lawyers. You're uh, approachable. You're trying to make the deal happen, not trying to derail the deal. A lot of times lawyers get the uh, kind of the reputation of being deal killers, and you're certainly going to watch out for folks and tell them about the landmines, but you're about getting deals done, not about not doing deals. And I know that uh, we've been uh, together for many, many years professionally and as friends, and this is a, a great time, we think, but let's get your input. Your clients do a lot of syndications and hire you to vet paperwork on syndications and so forth. What are you seeing from your uh, end? Yeah, well, all of my clients are syndications, and that's all I do, right? So uh, all of my clients are out there aggregating capital. And what I've noticed here, you know, middle to the end of this COVID pandemic that we're in the middle of is just what you mentioned. There's a lot of opportunity that's kind of brewing out there. And most of my clients want to be positioned and ready for that opportunity. So they want to have their ducks in a row. They want to have the capital in the bank account. They want to be ready to go. There might be some opportunities. A lot of them think there's going to be some opportunities, you know, if you can come to the table with, you know, a cash deal, for example, and that you can close in a week. You know, you'll have a kind of a competitive advantage over others. So a lot of my clients are coming out of the woodwork to put together these opportunity funds knowing that, you know, in the next few months or whenever that happens, they're, they're going to be ready and uh, ready to pull the trigger. Well, Marisa, let's uh, start at the beginning. No investor left behind. We talk a lot about syndication. It's part of our wheelhouse, but we also talk about uh, lots of other real estate investment opportunity. We kind of started by teeing up what a syndication is and why we think it makes so much sense. But from a legal side, what's all the fuss about? What's all this concern? How is it that I need to be aware, not just of the market and the provider and the real estate deal, but also the 
legal side? Yeah, so that's a great question. It's probably one of the most common issues that I come up with, uh, which is most of my clients are, are investing in real estate, right? So you're buying a piece of property, you're getting your buddies together, or, you, or you're getting a, a legitimate syndication together. Why is the securities laws involved? Why is the SEC in my business? I'm just trying to buy a piece of property. And, and the reason that the SEC is involved is because their definition of a security is really broad. Uh, most people think of securities as stocks and bonds and mutual funds and things like that. But uh, it really is a very broad definition. Essentially, anytime you take money from investors, from passive investors, where the returns are generated by your efforts, anytime you take money from investors where the returns are generated by your efforts, meaning they're just giving you a check, going home and relying on you to do all the work, that is a security under the definition of security under the SEC, which is why we now have to now focus on making sure that we're complying with all the federal and state securities laws. And this is a big legal arena, so you do have to get your head around it. You don't have to be paranoid about it. You just have to learn it, and that's what you help folks do. Of course, they're not having to become an attorney. They just need to find a great attorney and make sure that they're doing the right things. And the big part of that has to do with disclosure and the proper paperwork, and, and we're not going to to burden down all the specifics of that. There's plenty of places for people to learn that. In fact, you've got a great ebook coming out. We're going to give folks an opportunity to get their hands on before we're done. So don't feel like you have to memorize everything we say today. But I think from a mindset perspective, you just have to understand it's no longer just you and your money. Now somebody else's money is at risk. So I have to be that much more careful. Yeah. And this is where, you know, Russ always says you don't have to be a technician. You don't have to know every little detail. That's what your professional is for. But you want to have a sort of an overall understanding of kind of a contextual understanding so you can have an intelligent conversation with your attorney. So understanding the big picture is important. So when you have those phone calls or meetings with the attorneys, you know what to ask for, you kind of know what to look for. But that's that's one of the biggest things that, that we, we focus on is making sure that everybody's in compliance and, uh, you know, kind of big picture. I think you were, you were get going there, Robert. Once you understand that you're, you've entered the world of securities laws, then there's really, as I like to say, there's only three things we really focus on. And that is either registering it, that syndication with the SEC, finding an exemption, or it's illegal. It's really that simple. Those are the three. And of course, uh, you've been teaching at the Secrets of Successful Syndication, our now two-day event on real estate syndication since the beginning. And before we're done, we'll probably shamelessly promote the next event, but that's really not the purpose of the show. Instead, it's to give you enough understanding to decide, is this worth pursuing? Is this something that makes sense to do? And when it comes to that, the vast majority of syndicators that we know and deal with aren't going to go through the trouble of actually registering their security security, they're going to rely on an exemption. Kind of explain why that is. Yeah, well, the, the registration process just takes forever. That's essentially going public, right? So it's going to take you, you know, a couple of years to get through the SEC system. It's going to cost you six or seven figures. And most real estate investors have a deadline, right? They're, they're under contract, they're under the gun, they've got to close in 60, 90, 120 days. You don't have time to go submit your syndication to the SEC and wait for the government to get back to you and go back and forth and, and wait two years. Like, you need to go now. So that's why we're always looking for exemptions to registration, which is really what I focus on. And, you know, luckily for us, there's a couple of exemptions that are really, really popular, which allow people to, to raise capital privately with friends and family and people they have relationships with. And it, it doesn't have to be overbearing. Yes, there's a lot of disclosures that we have to provide. That's really our main compliance, especially if you have non-accredited investors, essentially non-high net worth individuals. But that's what your attorney's for. So you don't need to worry about that kind of stuff. You just need to understand that when you're taking money from other people and you're doing the work, you, your next thought should be, I better find a securities attorney to help me navigate that those waters. And from that point of view, if you're thinking about passively investing, which is a great way to get exposure to bigger deals, different markets, probably places you couldn't get into on your own, then you're going to want to understand it as well because you're on the receiving end, if you will. And most of these documents are fairly involved. Again, this isn't to dissuade. In fact, we would rather persuade people that this makes sense because what we need is more high integrity, honest operators in the business. And there are certainly those people out there, but there's a lot of the other kind as well. And one of the things that's great about syndication is you do have these legal hurdles. And I think that's a good thing. It means that sometimes you, I know, have to slow clients down. They're excited about the deal. They're excited about closing. They want to go raise the money. They got friends who want to throw money at them. You sometimes have to slow them down to go faster and make sure that they are paying attention to these things. Yeah. And they've got to pay attention because some of the things, you know, and it, you know, not just the disclosures, but they're, 
there are things that you just can't do depending on what, you know, what exemption we select, right? That's why it's so important to get your attorney involved early so we can make a decision of which direction are we going to go, because depending on which one you pick will dictate what you can and cannot do, right? And so I'll give you a great example, which is one of the ones I bring up in my ebook, but it's the whole notion of advertising or posting your deal on social media, on Facebook, on your website, on a podcast like this, you know, can you do that? And the answer is, it depends. Right. You know, sometimes you can do that because we're relying on an exemption that allows you to go on podcasts and advertise and do whatever you want to do. But sometimes we rely on exemptions that specifically prohibit that. So you don't need to know the details, but you need to know, for example, whether you can put a Facebook post, uh, you know, talking about your deal or whether the particular exemption you're relying on will prohibit that. Well, and that's an important point because I think in people's excitement, they do go out and want to spread the word. And, you know, a few years back when we started teaching syndication, it was really a different ball game. You had to be very, very careful about it. In fact, you couldn't advertise. You had to have a personal substantive relationship the folks you were dealing with had to be accredited or sophisticated at least there are a lot of rules now the basis of those rules still does exist today but with the laws that we've seen in the last few years it now is easier for syndicators surprising but true that our government in the u.s has made it easier and i should say that uh, why you are a u.s attorney and we're talking when we say for instance security and exchange commission we're talking about u.s law what we're talking about from a subject point of view is valid valid in lots of other countries. It's up to you if you're not in the United States to figure out the security side, but there likely is a requirement for the things that Mauricio is talking about. Just understand the terminology might be different. But, you know, I think today we are seeing the people who see other syndicators advertising their deals and think I can do that too. But this is an area people can get into trouble in quick. Yeah. And, and you know, it's only become an issue because as, as of, you know, seven years ago, really in, in 2013, when the SEC opened up the the avenue of, of potentially advertising, um, for some reason, you know, people started advertising pursuant to that exemption and it kind of carried over to the one that didn't allow you to advertise. And then look, with the, with the advent of social media, you think about when, when this new rule came, came about in 2013, you know, social media was around, obviously Facebook and, and I think even LinkedIn was around, but it certainly wasn't at the level where it is today where everybody's on there and everybody's posting. So people are just not aware that what they're doing is even considered advertising when they're put, they just think they're posting about their particular property or their syndication. And they're saying, well, I'm not asking for money, so it must be okay. Or they are on a podcast and they go, well, what's wrong with me talking about the fact that I have a, you know, have a, an, an active deal going? Well, you need to understand that a, a lot of the time, a lot of the time, but in fact, most of the time that's not allowed because most people select a particular exemption that prohibits or limits you to that kind of activity. And let's think about why that is, right? The government puts in all kinds of regulations to protect people from unscrupulous operators. So we're in favor of some of that thinking. At the same time, people are big boys and girls. And at some level, they ought to be able to decide. And that kind of runs into this whole accredited investor idea. So take us through what that is. People hear that word. Maybe they're not sure. It is definitely a distinction whether or not an investor is a accredited in the eyes of the U.S. government or not accredited doesn't mean you can't invest if you are or if you aren't, but it is definitely a distinction that starts to become a consideration for which exemption a syndicator wants to use. It's a key distinction. So let's make sure that uh, no investor left behind. So an accredited investor is somebody that has a million dollars in net worth, excluding their primary residence or on an income side, they've earned $200,000 the last couple of years and have a reasonable expectation of earning that much or more this year. And the reason that's important is twofold. Number one, as you mentioned, it dictates what exemptions were allowed. For example, if you wanna pick an exemption that allows you to advertise, which we all love, that exemption is going to limit you to only accepting accredited investors. So that's one where it, it can come in. The other point it pops up a lot is that the level of disclosures that you're required to provide investors differ if they're accredited or non-accredited. The law, whether they're right or wrong, assumes that if you're an accredited investor, then you know what you're doing, you're sophisticated, you have the, the wherewithal to lose the money. And so they're not as concerned with you. And so you actually don't have to provide them with as much disclosures as you would a non-accredited investor that the law sees as somebody unsophisticated and really needs their protection. And so when you're dealing with non-accredited investors, the amount of disclosures, both 
both material and financial is just much higher than if you're dealing with somebody that's not accredited. And again, the theory is if someone has a million dollars of net worth, not counting their home, or they make $200,000 or more, that they probably have earned the right to be able to make judgment decisions about their money. Those are arbitrary numbers. You could certainly argue that's not true. I know people that aren't yet accredited that are pretty sophisticated and certainly could make those uh, kinds of decisions well. And I know people that technically are accredited that have no business is making those decisions, but it is the rule that we're stuck with. And so being aware of that is, is certainly important. And there's a lot of other nuances we won't get to, but just know you have to understand, for instance, you know, whose job it is to confirm that they're accredited or not. And that's going to depend on the uh, exemption that they use. And then what kind of paperwork is actually involved? What does it have to look like? What are the mandatory disclosures and so forth? Those are just the things you need to know. And again, that's not to scare you away. There's lots of great places where you can go to find this out. It's just knowing that it's a little different when you're dealing with other people's money. Now, the vast majority of syndicators typically do this, Marisa. They find a great property. Maybe they already know the market. They already have a great team, but they find something that they can't do on on their own and they say man if i only had an extra 600 grand i could do this deal so they set out to go raise the money that's when they have to engage you or uh, somebody like you to put together that part of the deal but they kind of know the other part and so they're already doing real estate they already know that stuff this is just one more layer of information that they have and they typically do their first syndication on a specific property they're in multifamily. they go find a great multifamily deal and they raise the money they still might get a loan probably would they still would hire a third party management all the things Things that are prudent to do in your own investment account make sense at syndication. You're just leveraging those skills as a passive investor. But you also talked at the beginning about this idea of a fund, and that's a little different. So sometimes it's a specific deal. We've got this property at this address. It costs this much. We're raising this much, and we're getting a loan for this much, and there's this much CapEx, capital expenditure improvement we're going to do. But this idea of a fund, I think we're going to see more of that coming out of uh, this coronavirus epidemic. Um, talk about that type of an investment. Yeah, you know, pre-COVID, most people were doing, you know, project-specific deals. They would identify the properties you mentioned, and then they would go out and find the investors to purchase that particular property. Uh, the other way to do it is reverse. Uh, go raise the money first without really having identified the property. And then once you raise the money, then you go out looking for whatever you've promised to do. And that's what we call a fund. And the fund is, from a, from a security standpoint, it's very similar from, you know, what exemption and the disclosures and all that stuff, but it obviously differs tremendously from what you're presenting your investors, right? The investors in a fund don't have the benefit of knowing exactly what property you're buying, what market the property's in. They, they can't see your, your underwriting and your pro forma. They can't see the assumptions that you're making so they can challenge those assumptions. You know, maybe your assumption is you're going to get the property from a 80% occupancy to 90. And you said, well, that's a little aggressive. I'm going to underwrite it differently. Or maybe they think rents are going to go up by 5% and you think that's aggressive and you think rents are going to stay flat. I mean, there's things that you can do when you actually are looking at a property and the materials that the, the syndicator gives you. With a fund, you don't have any of that, right? With a fund, you're literally betting on the jockey. You have full faith in the syndicator that whatever that they are, the syndicator is telling you they're going to go do with the money, you have faith in that individual. Yes, they're going to give you parameters. They're going to tell you that they're going to buy real estate. They're going to probably tell you the type of real estate they're going to buy is multifamily, self-storage, mobile homes, you know, single family homes, what have you. They may even tell you the market. Uh, a lot of people will say, look, I'm looking in the Texas, Oklahoma, Florida. Those are kind of my markets. And so those are the kinds you want to see. But at the end of the day, you're going to relinquish that right to the syndicator and they're going to use your money in their best capacity, but also obviously in the best interest of the, of the investors. But that, that's the main difference between those two is just the, 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 the amount of information that the investor has in making a decision. We're talking with attorney Marisa Roll today about syndication. We think the single best opportunity in real estate right now. We'll uh, continue the conversation when we get back. Plus, we're going to give away a cool prize for real estate trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. In uncertain times like this, it's great to know there are two things you can always count on. High demand for affordable single-family homes to live in and Terry Kerr's amazing Memphis team at Mid-South Home Buyers to find, fix, and manage the next addition to your recession-resistant real estate portfolio. The Memphis market is logistics and distribution dynamo with an economic engine that's essential to moving goods and critical supplies all over the United States. 
quality rehab, proven profitable property management, affordable rents, and solid ROI make turnkey property investing through Terry's team a dream when it matters most. To learn more about Memphis and Mid South home buyers, send an email to Mid South at realestateguysradio.com. That's Mid South at realestateguysradio.com. For thousands of years of human history, silver has been recognized as money. But then in 1965, the United States took silver out of the financial system. But did silver stop being money? Smart investors don't think so. And ever since, when there are concerns about the quality of the currency, alert investors seek shelter in silver and gold. As the size and frequency of major financial crises grow, silver is attracting a lot of attention. To help better understand the what, why, and how of silver, watch the free nine-part series, Making Sense of Silver, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Silver But Didn't Know to Ask, featuring 30-year precious metals veteran Dana Samuelson. Send your email requests to silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Whether you own silver now or you're wondering if it's too late, email silverseries at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Steve Forbes. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Have fun. You'll learn something. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this fine radio station and all the time at realestateguysradio.com. We're glad you're here as we discuss the single best opportunity in real estate right now, and that is aggregating capital, investing together. Before we get back to our interview with attorney Marisa Raul, it's time to play real estate trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing today's real estate trivia question. The first person that gets it right gets an awesome book called Don't Quit, Stories of Persistence, Courage, and Faith. And Mauricio has contributed a chapter to that book. That can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. As soon as you hear the question and think you know the answer, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, the answer to the question, and your mailing address so we can send you your prize. Last week on The Real Estate Guys, it was another edition of Ask the Guys, and we asked you this. How did the state of Nevada get its name? Well, the Spanish influence is evident in Nevada, whose name is derived from the Spanish phrase Sierra Nevada, meaning snow-covered mountain range. And a pretty good beer. Nevado is Spanish for covered in snow or snow-capped, and that's how Nevada or Nevada, got its name. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. One of my favorite scenes from the B-movie is right at the end, where Chris Rock, who plays a mosquito, shows up as an attorney, and the client says, you're an attorney? And he says, lady, I was already a blood-sucking parasite. All I needed was a briefcase. So in honor of that, here's our real estate trivia question with Mauricio on the show. Name the most mosquito-infested city in the U.S., Yeah, the city with the most mosquitoes. Now, this information was released just a few months ago for the 2019 year. Name the most mosquito-infested city in the U.S. If you think you know, or maybe you live there, just send an email to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, your mailing address, and the answer to the question. First person that gets it right gets Don't Quit. Stories of persistence, courage, and faith. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking today about the single best opportunity in real estate right now. We think that's real estate syndication. Our guest is attorney Marisu Raoul, who wrote an amazing chapter in that book we just gave away, Don't Quit. This is something, not everybody knows this. They've maybe heard you on our show for years and years and years, but uh, we almost lost you there, brother. <laughs> yeah, I had a, quite, a, quite a little experience uh, back in... Uh, what is it now? 2018 that this went down. Yep. Um, yeah, I actually, you know, I, I got sick and uh, I went in for, I wouldn't say routine surgery. It was a, sort of a, a major surgery, but it certainly wasn't supposed to take uh, more than five days in the hospital and maybe a couple of weeks to recover. And uh, and so I went into that and that turned into a uh, sort of a six months in the hospital. And uh, I'm still kind of recovering, but it took about a year to recover. And, and for, for a while there, there was a little bit of concern that I wasn't going to make it, spend some time in the ICU. So uh, but a lot of great lessons that came out of that. And, and uh, that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to share the story in the, in the book is uh, there's a lot of great lessons uh, that I, that I truly believe I'm, I'm better off today than I, than I would have been if I, if I had not gone through that experience. Yeah. It's a great perspective and we won't steal your thunder, but definitely if you didn't manage to uh, win the book this week, go pick it up. Don't quit stories of persistence, courage, and faith. A bunch of great stories in there from uh, some real estate folks and, and other people as well. But, you know, we're talking about this idea of syndication and I know you you get approached by two groups of people, people that are saying, yeah, I get it. I want to go do this deal. I think that sounds good. And the other group that says, 
Um, I kind of uh, did a syndication and didn't realize it, and uh, I broke a lot of laws and now help me out, which is why you've written this new ebook, which is really designed to keep people on the right side of the law. In fact, you call it Five Things Every Syndicator Must Know to Stay Out of Jail. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that was frustrating for me was, look, the odds of you going to jail, as I was mentioning before this show started, are, are, are not high. And unless you're defrauding your investors, obviously, if you're intentionally, you have a Ponzi scheme going and you're trying to rip off your investors, then clearly you're going to jail. But the, the purpose of the title and the purpose of the, of the, of the ebook is just to, to make people aware that these are serious matters. These are, these are felonies if you don't comply. And most likely they result in bankruptcy and you know you're barred from doing this ever again and you've got to return all the money plus interest even if it's not your fault i mean there are some serious consequences and the defense of well i didn't know about it or hey everybody's doing it those two defenses don't really hold water so i wanted to kind of highlight the five topics or five things that i just over the years i feel are the most common misperceptions or, or things that people don't really focus on um, and so that's why I, I came up with the ebook. So if you're thinking about being a syndicator or you already are one, we'll make sure we tell you how to get a copy of the ebook before we're done. But let's take us through a couple of these. I'm guessing we don't have time to cover all five, but uh, what are like the big ones, ones that people really need to watch out about or be aware of, especially if they're thinking about becoming a real estate syndicator? Yeah, I mean, I think the first one, well, the first one, which is by far the biggest mistakes, and we touched upon it a little bit at the beginning, is just people not realizing that they're actually selling securities, that they're actually syndicating. And, and it's understandable because they're, buying real estate. And so they don't understand why securities is involved. But but there are definitely you know more seasoned uh, syndicators that are out there that are trying to get around the rules by being creative. And, and the, the point there to understand is that how you structure things or how creative you want to be or, hey, you know, a side contract or you know, maybe do a direct ownership, a TIC arrangement, those are all irrelevant. You know, the SEC is really going to look at, you know, are you the one doing all the work or, and are your investors passive? Um, and that that applies, you know, for like joint ventures, for example, is one of my favorites. People come up and say, well, this is really a joint venture. It's not a security. That's not going to be your call, right? The SEC will make the call whether it's a joint venture or security. So even if you call it a joint venture and it turns out it's not, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, and then the other one, which I love, is just the idea of, of of structuring things with promissory notes. Well, it's a promissory note. It's not really a security. It's a note. And that's not true either. And there's there's, there's actually there's a presumption. It's actually in the statute itself. If you read the definition of a security, I think the second one there, or the third one is a note. So there's just all these, this, these misperceptions of people thinking that because they've done it a certain way, or maybe they've even raised a certain amount of money that somehow these securities laws don't apply to them. When of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, we see this kind of start innocently enough, right? A guy's doing a deal. He doesn't quite have enough capital or it costs him more for whatever reason. And his buddy goes, oh, I'll throw 50 grand in and they go, oh, okay, great. We'll just write up a note. And it's, you know, a handshake between friends, except it's just became a security. And so what happens at the live event, as you're explaining this, is I can look out of the audience and I see a couple of the gasps, which are pretty much folks that uh, did it wrong and hopefully relied on the good deal defense, which is not a good defense, by the way. The good deal defense says, well, everyone got their money back and made a profit. And even though we didn't do it right, it's okay. After the statute of limitations, it, it's not okay, but that does, you know, happen. And I I think the message here is be prepared ahead of time. Learn what you need to do to do it right. Even if it's you and a couple buddies, it's still a security and there's still proper ways to handle the paperwork. And you shouldn't feel bad about it. I actually get a, a lot of calls from, from attorneys, uh, attorneys that don't specialize in securities laws. <laughs> I just had a conversation with someone last week. Uh, they're in New York and they were about to recommend to their client just to put together an operating agreement or whatever. And somehow he connected with uh, with another attorney. He said, what, what are you crazy? Are you trying to get disbarred? Are you trying to, you, this is a security, go talk to a securities lawyer. So that's how he and I connected. But uh, it's, it's just a kind of a, a common misperception that, uh, you know, that, that securities laws sometimes apply when it may not logically makes sense. So most folks don't get into trouble with this on purpose. They fall into it. You know, they do something wrong without thinking about it. And maybe not every single thing can be anticipated in advance, but a lot of them can. What are some of the most common mistakes that you see, whether it's after the fact or people getting ready to do a deal that you have to then help fix? Yep. We talked a little bit about the, the advertising, so I won't dwell on that again. The other one that's a big one these days is, is people either paying referral fees or just flat out paying other people to raise money for them. It's very enticing, you know, suddenly, especially if it's the first time you've done this and you're trying to raise 
a million dollars or two million dollars and you start the process and realize how it's not as easy as it might sound and you end up you know raising three four hundred and you're kind of getting a little bit concerned or desperate and then suddenly somebody comes in the the knight in shining armor comes in and says, hey i can bring you a million dollars in equity i've got people already lined up just give me a cut of the deal or pay me some kind of a fee or commission or referral fee whatever that's not allowed. You cannot pay somebody compensation for them simply raising the money. And, and that's something that the SEC is actually seriously taking a look at now and cracking down. I know of at least two deals, uh, two investigations that the SEC is involved with attacking really that specific thing. There's, there's people actually teaching this, that they're, they're trying to get people to raise money for them in exchange for you know a percentage of the company or, or some kind of a fee, which is, which is not good. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that because again, it begins innocently enough. You know, oh, my buddy knows a lot of people with money. He's gonna put 200 grand in my deal. He could probably bring in some friends. What can I do for him? I mean, you know, those are like nice sentiments, but the law is very clear on this. Unless you're licensed in specific ways, you cannot be paid to go raise money. And I think the problem people run into is when they say, well, you know, Mauricio, how can I, how can I do this without, you know, breaking the law? And, and the bottom line is you, you really, you really can't, nor, nor should you even be thinking that way. Yeah, that's the hard part. You know, it's, it's not that complicated, but that's, you're exactly right. People are like, well, I kind of need to do it. So how do I structure this or how do I make it seem so that it doesn't look like I'm paying them to raise money? It looks like something else. And that's where it gets slippery. You know, the rule is very simple on that. You know, as you mentioned, you, you either have to be a licensed broker dealer, uh, which most people aren't, and you certainly are not going to spend the time to go do that unless this is something you're going to do full time. And even then you may want to think about it. But uh, the way that you, you, you really do it, the proper way to do it is you come in as a legitimate co-sponsor. You become one of the one of the people helping put this deal together and adding value just like everybody else is. And you do substantial work. That's the key word. You must do substantial work in that syndication and your primary responsibilities, primary, must be doing that substantial work, not raising the money. The raising the money is incidental. Everybody has to raise money. Obviously, that's part of the deal. But your substantial duties has to be something else. And your primary focus needs to be on those substantial duties. And again, this is all facts and circumstances. There's no black and white. But uh, you, you can see pretty quickly or pretty easily, actually, when you start hearing fact patterns, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now able to kind of let them know, well, here's the facts that aren't really good for you. And, and I give them some other examples and they, they start understanding it. But yeah, they want to force it through and they want to structure it in certain ways that I just don't think add, adds up. All right. Well, the ebook is called Five Things Every Syndicator Must Know to Stay Out of Jail. Uh, when we come back, we will tell you how you can get a copy of that. In the meantime, we are getting close to our next Secrets of Successful Syndication. I think you pretty much taught at every one of these. Even when you were in the hospital, we played a video of you teaching. And uh, this is a great event. Talk about the event and uh, just the takeaways, what people are going to learn and what you're going to share. Yeah, well, obviously, it's a fantastic event, not only for the content, uh, but just obviously the, the environment that you're in, you know, with like-minded people, everybody there is looking to syndicate and it's just it's just a great environment. But yeah, what, what I try to do is, and is kind of what I mentioned at the beginning, you know, my, my job is to give you the context. You know, I want you, I feel like syndication is kind of a puzzle. You know, Russ talks about it as being a quarterback with different moving pieces. I like to think of it as a puzzle and the legal piece is just one of those multiple puzzles. And so my job is to let you know where the legal piece fits into the overall puzzle. And I really try and focus on context, obviously deliver a lot of content as well, but I really want to make sure that by the time you leave, you at least have a good grasp of big picture of what you should be looking for. And you, you don't walk away thinking, man, I don't know what I don't know. Now you actually do know what you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I always appreciate about you is you do it at a level that everyone understands. You make it fun, you're approachable, and uh, you really are the anti-lawyer. So uh, thanks for, uh, again, sharing your big brain with us today. No, thanks for having me. Always good to be on. There's our friend and attorney, Mauricio Raul. We'll talk more about the secrets of successful syndication and how you can meet Mauricio when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise 
CDs or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hi, this is Doug Casey, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. And welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this great radio station and all the time at realestateguysradio.com. I tell you what, I learn something every time we have Mauricio on the show, and I think he is the guest that has been on our show the second most number of times behind Robert Kiyosaki. (laughs) Well, that's good company to be in. Now, uh, Mauricio is a great guy, a great friend, been a part of our team and culture for a very, very long time. And uh, it's funny you mentioned Robert Kiyosaki because that's how Mauricio found us, actually. Uh, back in the day in Southern California, we had our investor mentoring program, and uh, we did a front-end event where people could come called Profitable Real Estate Investing, and Mauricio was driving around in Southern California listening to the radio, and he heard an ad with a drop-in with Robert Kiyosaki endorsing the real estate guys, and he had just read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He goes, well, I don't know these real estate guys, but I know Robert Kiyosaki, and so uh, I'm going to go check it out. And, uh, of course, that was a date with destiny for him, changed his whole life. Uh, And it's been great for us because he's changed a lot of people's lives. You know, we didn't really know that we were going to be teaching syndication or sharing the opportunities in syndication. At that time, we might not even have been syndicating ourselves at any major level. But but what happened for us is we realized the opportunity to go bigger faster by aggregating capital from private investors. And we started to do that. And in the course of doing that, we made some mistakes, got in a little over our head. So we brought Mauricio in to be our general counsel. And he was the quarterback of uh, a team of highly experienced attorneys. And that's kind of where he grew up in the business, if you will. And then he recognized that there was this little sweet spot, this little niche. You know, you had these securities firms that were working with big funds and big people, and they were expensive and cold and impersonal. And and he said, I can create this little boutique firm and, and, and focus on helping these mom and pop investors become serious syndicators. And now, I mean, we look back and just the, the thousands of people that have come through the program and several, I mean, lots of them have raised many, many millions of dollars. Of course, our star student, Dave Zook, is probably closing in on $200 million right now. And he doesn't show any signs of slowing. He's going to maybe be our first billion-dollar man. He was our first $100 million man. Uh, and it's just gratifying to see. But I think that the lesson here is... Is that to go big, you have to think big to start with, but you also have to have the right people on the bus. And if you decide to do this business, even though it's like the most unattractive and boring and often it feels like the most expensive part of getting your syndication business started, you got to have a great securities attorney. You really do. You're going to have to have great other people too, but that that's kind of the main person because that's a person who's helping you prepare all your offering documents and where a lot of attorneys are looking at places to kill the deal. Mauricio, the anti lawyer is the kind of guy that's looking for ways to make the deal come. And when you deal with somebody that specializes in the niche, he brings a collective experience of all his other clients to your problem. So I love that about him. Hey, if you want to get his ebook and it is called the five things every syndicator must know to stay out of jail, all you have to do is send an email to jail at realestateguysradio.com. I know you're not really going to go to jail, but still it's kind of fun. Jail at realestateguysradio.com. You'll get a copy of that ebook for free. And I think Russ, in our time remaining, we really have to make the argument that it is the single best opportunity in real estate syndication that is. And we've talked legal because we've had Mauricio on, but I think there's some other really compelling parts. And you mentioned one without really mentioning it, and that is already we have seen hundreds of millions of dollars transact in these kinds of deals just in our students and people that have come to this event and gone on to do deals. And some of them we stay in contact with and we know well, and some of them they come to an event and four years later we get the, hey guys, I just hit $10 million. I mean, it's so 
awesome to see that people really do the thing. And the caliber of people that comes amazing, but it's because there's huge opportunity. Whatever it is that you do to live, thrive, and survive, you may be a part-time real estate investor and you've got your gig on the front end and maybe that's working an hour, maybe COVID shut you down. There's an opportunity in syndication to literally create unlimited wealth unlimited wealth. When I first stumbled into syndication, I thought, well, this is a great passive way to invest. I'll tell the full story at the syndication event, but I was a passive investor, got the bug, started becoming an active investor and had dozens of projects going on and it increased my income a lot. So if you're thinking about, I'd like to earn money, it could be great for you, but there's a bigger picture, which is you can do deals that you never before were even in the running for. Yeah, well, that's that's the whole thing. And it's actually easier to go bigger. That's the big myth. People think it's easier to be small. It's easier to go big because you can hire help. The line items of the help you need on your budget uh, on a small project eat up a big percentage of the profit. But on a big project, you don't need a proportionate number of people. I mean, you know, if you're if you're processing a deal and it's a hundred million dollar deal or a twenty million dollar deal or a five million dollar deal, the hundred million dollar deal isn't twenty times more expensive to do. Uh, now, there's also the sweet spot of being in those little small multi-million, you know, the deals that are somewhere between five and $25 million because uh, they're too small for a lot of the big players. They just don't play that small. You know, when you're talking about raising $5 million in equity, $10 million in equity, you know, that's just not a big enough deal for somebody that says, hey, my minimum is going to be 50 or $100 million. But for a mom and pop investor, it can be pretty good. And there's lots of deals that you can do in the in the three to $5 million equity range. And so that's what, what's that, 30 investors at $100,000 each? I mean, probably... Anybody listening to this knows 30 people that have been laid off that probably have a 401k that's eligible for rollover that has at least $100,000 in it. To aggregate a few million dollars uh, is not that difficult. So there's just a lot of money available. There's no doubt about that. I think some of the weaknesses in the stock market, yes, the numbers in the stock market look good, but I think anybody with half a brain cell understands those are manipulated numbers. Those indexes reflect just a few companies that are soaring and the rest of them are wallowing. It makes zero sense in an environment where Companies are shut down. Big corporations are going bankrupt. Tens of millions of people on unemployment. How in the world is our stock market booming? That makes no sense. So I think what's going to happen is people who have been playing the paper asset game, whether it's on the stock side or the bond side, are going to recognize it's time to get real. And you know, when you think about real, and you see this in the stock market, stock investors will begin to gravitate towards consumer staples. They will begin to gravitate towards real estate investment trusts. They will begin to gravitate towards things that are more real, but they're still paper. Whereas if you're a purveyor of real estate syndications, it doesn't get too much more real than that, right? I mean, and it's very flat. Instead of having all these layers of people between you and the deal, like you do in Wall Street, there's basically you as the investor the sponsor or the syndicator and the deal. That's it, yeah. right? It's not a huge overhead. So most of the profit from the deal actually makes it to the investor, which is great. And personally, from a moral and ethical perspective, I'm a big fan of Main Street investing in Main Street. It makes absolutely no sense to me that people on Main Street who do the real work and pull the real freight in this world are going to go out and earn money and then send it to Wall Street and let Wall Street you know, put it through their machinery, siphon off whatever it is they take, take an inordinate amount of risks with it, either lose it completely or or end up needing to get a bailout and then send back scraps to Main Street. Why, why shouldn't you, if you're a mom and pop investor out there driving around your community, why shouldn't you invest in that new apartment building? Why shouldn't you be the one that buys that self-storage center? I mean, you may not know how to do it, but there are people out there who know how to do it. And you can have a piece of that action. That's what syndication is all about. There's lots of people out there who want to have a shopping service, if you will, for their money. They've got paper profits. They've got equity in properties, maybe. They've got a rollover 401k, and they're going, I don't know if I want to be in the stock market. I'd rather be on Main Street, but I don't know how to do it. I wish there was a shopping service that I could just have somebody help me. Well, that's what you, you know, if you want to be on the syndication side, if you've got sales experience, property management experience, if you've got real estate experience, uh, you're probably going to bring something to the table and then you raise the money, put together all the the talent that you need, starting with a great securities attorney, but technical advisors. And then you go find deals, put them together, make profits, share the profits, and you diversify the risk for yourself and for your investors. I mean, it's just win, win, win all around. And it just got better because we're about to see a time where there's going to be bargains. If you believe that there are 
are great opportunities coming in the next couple of years in real estate and or if you could do more deals, if you just have more capital, well, then the big gap you got to jump over is how do I raise money legally? How do I put together the team? How do I make sure that I'm following the rules? And that's what we talk about at the Secrets of Successful Syndication. If you want uh, Mauricio's ebook, just send an email to jail at realestateguysradio.com. If you want to hear his complete presentation on syndication, join us for the Secrets of Successful Syndication happens at the end of September. And all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com. Under events, you'll see the Secrets of Successful Syndication. It's a great event, whether you're thinking of investing passively or you think, hey, maybe I could be that syndicator. Either way, you'll learn a ton, meet a bunch of great people, and we have a killer faculty. Again, all the details at the website. Big thanks to Maurice Everold for sharing his time with us today. Until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid South Home Buyers, low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.